All right. So we're live. Welcome to this lovely Thursday, 12 p.m., June 4th. This is Two Feathers Native American Family Services speaking series. And today's uh, theme is our narrative therapy speaker series. And it's part of our Checks Hope for Tomorrow Su Youth Suicide Prevention uh, Project. And we're really happy. I'm really happy to have uh, Dr. Ronnie Schwartz, my colleagues Amada Lang and uh, Amy Matheson. Uh, we'll introduce all of uh, ourselves. Uh, but before that, I want to pay honor to the territory that we're currently on here at Two Feathers, and that's the Wiat uh, people. And I also want to uh, put out to all those people that are tuning in that uh, Two Feathers uh, stands in solidarity with what's going on in the sense of the fight for social justice for people of color. And, uh, and we are here to do anything that we can to support the Native American communities and other traditionally historically oppressed communities. Uh, with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Amy and Amada to introduce themselves. And then I'll also, uh, Amy's gonna introduce our, our guest today, which is none other than the local professor from Humboldt State, Ronnie Schwartz. I'll go ahead and introduce myself since Amy's gonna do the honors. Um, my name's Amada Lang. I am going, a current graduate student at HSU in the Environment and Community Grad Program just starting this year. Um, I actually was in, Ronnie's class for my undergrad during my freshman year. So uh, this is going to be fun, I think, just to connect it to the whole idea of what we're discussing today. And I look forward to speaking with all everybody. And if you have any questions, tune in and ask those as well, because I'm excited to get everybody involved. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Amy Matheson. I am a family support coordinator here at Two Feathers. Uh, I work with a great team of people in our Making Relatives program to provide um, intensive wraparound services to our local families. And I have the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Ronnie Schwartz. Um, he is a professor of social work at Humboldt State University. He served as the chair of HSU Social Work Department from 2009 to 2018. Dr. Schwartz has consulted with young people, families, adults, and organizations in education, healthcare, behavioral health, substance abuse, juvenile justice, child welfare, and advocacy systems. Dr. Schwartz is the director of the Altruistic Behavior Institute at Humboldt State. His current research, teaching, writing, and practice includes narrative therapy and community work, harm reduction in relationship to uh, problematic drug use and drug policy, social economic policy, values, ethics, and the cultivation of love, kindness, and care skills in social work practice. Thank you for being here, Ronnie. Thank you, Amy and Virgil and Amada, and thank you for, for reading that, Amy. It feels kind of weird hearing that, because um, so often I think about how much more I can do <laughs> to try to be useful to communities. And that makes it sound like I've done a bunch. And like, I, I don't think I've done nearly enough. Hey, I just, if I can just- impressive. <laughs> thanks, Amy. I, I just, uh, I, also, I will also want to uh, acknowledge and pay my respects to the WIAP people um, here in my house. My house is on uh, unceded uh, land that uh, uh, belongs to the WIAP people. Um, Actually, the specific little subdivision that I'm in was uh, uh, had a, a creek that used to run through it that you know white settlers have covered up. Um, that was an important place in the ancestral territory for the Wiyah people. Um, I also want to pay my respects to the other local tribes whose land I regularly traverse: the Yurok and the Hupa and the Karuk people and not as frequently, but I like to get up further north to where the Talawa people are. And I wanna acknowledge that this is uh, a very difficult time for so many people. 
um, experiencing anger and rage and, and guilt and frustration because of the murder of George Floyd. And um, I, I also wanna acknowledge that this is not a new thing. What, what tends to be new is the devices so many people carry that can capture and um, show to a wider audience what has been going on for a long time, whether it's in Minneapolis or anywhere else in the world where people of color are dealing with significant uh, dispossession, racism, marginalization, et cetera. So thanks for having me, particularly in a time like this. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have the opportunity of kind of starting our conversation off um, and it's flowing off of um, your last statements. Um, George Floyd's memorial is today. And, you know, as we know, our nation is grieving his brutal murder. Um, Two Feathers, uh, like Virgil said, is standing in solidarity with those experiencing deep hurt and pain during this time. Um, and if we're looking at it, I think from a narrative lens, um, narrative therapy is about, partly in about uh, examining the stories we carry and strengthening empowering stories. And I think during this time, uh, a lot of questions are being asked about what our culture's dominant stories and narratives are and how that impacts um, everybody who lives in this country in negative and in positive ways. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about uh, those stories and if you could speak to that and the importance of examining some of those dominant narratives. That's all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just um, a small question. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of uh, things right now. Um, and I guess um, in terms of like dominant narratives, I think of what I tend to call Western European domi dominant discourses, or um, this could be thought of as <clears throat> like the, the stories that are taken for granted about the world, they're sort of assumed to be true. And um, because from a narrative perspective, we story our world, like the world that we live in is brought into being through story. Stories are not just like ideas in the Western European dominant discourse, but they're also methods for how you can talk and how you can think and how you can express yourself. So, um, so we're talking about stories, but we're also talking about how people can conduct themselves or move their bodies through the world, what's considered legitimate and what's uh, considered illegitimate. So clearly people can move their bodies through the world in a variety of ways. There are lots of ways of showing protest, for example. Um, but a dominant discourse informs which of those ways of moving one's body through the world are considered okay and which are, are not okay. So that people who um, stand in a place of privilege from the dominant story, oftentimes people who look a lot like me, people who look white and people who show themselves to the world and what would be considered a, a male way or in some sort of way that's like being a man, um, uh, we, we can move through the world and say, well, that other way of moving through the world, that's not okay. Like this kind of protest is okay. This kind of protest is not okay. So that's just like one of the things that I'm thinking about right now is how different ways of, of doing protest or engaging in resistance are judged according to dominant narratives. Now, I'm, I'm not saying like, and I'm okay with this one and I'm not okay with that one. I'm trying to just call into question how dominant stories sanction particular ways of doing protest and marginalize others. And that's just one of many things that I'm thinking about right now. I don't know if that connects at all for what you were asking, Amy. 
Yeah, it absolutely does. And it reminds me of a quote that I read from Michael White, where he said, um, there are dominant stories about what it means to be a person, person of moral worth in our culture. So I think that speaks directly to that quote. Um, and, you know, it speaks directly to um, life, what life is valued and what life isn't valued in our culture. Yeah, for sure. Dominant stories give value to some phenomena, to some things, to some people, and don't give value to others. And dominant stories construct what uh, people consider to be morals. So um, if the dominant narrative is one where a moral agent is engaged in uh, productivity, and productivity is measured by uh, the contribution, for example, to like gross domestic product, then when people aren't employed in ways that lead to productivity, which is good for gross domestic product, then those people are not moral agents and they would have less value. And so if, if you believe that, if you believe that productivity is part of the dominant Western discourse, and I would suggest that um, there's a lot of evidence that backs up that productivity is part of the dominant Western um, discourse. You know, what considered, what counts for gross domestic product, product what, what doesn't count. But if you think that, and you have lots of people unemployed right now, then we could think that those people don't have moral uh, agency or are of less value because they're not participating in productivity, which is good for the gross domestic product. Thank you. Virgil, do you want to ask a question or Amada? I can go ahead and lead into the next one. Um, I think for me, dominant narratives, just attending school, being a student, and just being somebody right now in this situation, how we brought that to light in the beginning of just like what's going on right now, it's important to realize like what dominant narratives are out there kind of too, and what, how you're saying they're important for, I think, kind of in a sense of history and what's out there. But I also think too, it's important that I think some of them can not necessarily change, but you can shape dominant narratives of like today and what is going on, if that makes sense in a little bit of a way. But I felt, I'll kind of lead into this. I felt a little bit in that sense, um, when I was a freshman taking a class for Ronnie, it was intro to social work course. And some of the way that our course went around it is we would just do a lot of different approaches to the way that we learned. Some of them we would sing songs. I kind of in the beginning was like, why, how are we, this is a little different approach for a college course and how we're grasping it and what we're doing, but it was actually helping me really dive down into the core topics of what we were doing with some of the situations at hand, because some of it was deep, um, just an intro to social work class. And it was so deep for me that it was almost therapeutic in a way, in the sense of almost too much for me, where I was like, whoa, I don't know, because I was thinking of being a mat and going and that direction of that master's course and that but I was like this is bringing up a lot for me being able to do this and I actually didn't even realize it was that form of until all of this series even working for two feathers and so it's kind of been well-rounded and I wanted just to share that a little bit in the sense I can kind of put a grasp to what I was feeling in that time but for me I want to ask you Ronnie what kind of led you to wanting to teach in that way for students and have you seen a successful kind of has successful like rate with students grasping your subjects of what you're teaching and coming out with words of encouragement for you to keep going in the way that you're teaching thank you for for sharing a little bit about <clears throat> being in class with me about i appreciate that um you know you you, uh, when you first started talking just now, you were talking about how, how narratives can change. Um, I think that's really uh, a, an important point to highlight. And I'm glad that, that you acknowledge that and brought that up because um, the, the dominant narrative is not the only narrative. There are always multiple narratives of our lives. <clears throat> and what happens, the way that I think about it is that dominant narratives 
start to occupy more and more space in like a, a, a closed environment. And by occupying more space, the alternative narratives get pushed to the edges. They get pushed to the margins. That's why we might talk about something being marginalized. So they're there, they're just, they're just pushed to the edges. But what happens when, when something occupies space in like an enclosed environment and other things, I'm sort of, I'm thinking like gases here, are in the margins, uh, they're also pushing back. And that's what we call, what's what I think of as resistance. Like there's a pushing back on the dominant narratives. Um, not resistance like that uh, sort of Freud's idea of resistance, which is when people don't do what we experts think they should do. Um, I mean, resistance, that's a, a struggle and a pushing back. I mean, resistance in, a, in an active generative way. Um, so there are always these multiple stories and uh, how we can go about bringing about change is to uh, like uh, make it so that these resistance stories start to fill the space more. We can deconstruct dominant stories, which allows for more room for marginalized stories. And then we can start retelling those marginalized stories so that they occupy more space. To me, that's like, a metaphor for thinking about how narrative work happens, whether it's therapy with individuals and families, or if it's at the community level. So when I think about teaching, like to bring this around to teaching, I imagine that all of us who are in that classroom are living in a world where they're, uh, where we're all in this dominant European discourse. Some of us benefit tremendously from it, and some of us are really on the losing end of it, but we're all dealing with it. So how can we as a group tell the stories that are marginalized so that they occupy more space? Well, I can't do it uh, by myself, particularly because I am so privileged by those dominant stories. What I want to do is cultivate an environment where people with diverse life experiences can tell their stories, their knowledge, their lived experience, so that it occupies more space that all of us can benefit from. So that's how, well, that's one of the ways that I think about teaching is trying to bring forth a, this is like a, a theoretical idea too, but social construction of knowledge. So there's a whole like theory base about social construction. To me, that's what we're actually doing in the classroom. We are constructing knowledge and knowledge has to be constructed socially. It's never an individual achievement and it's never just like the experts. It's done through social engagement. So we do it together. Does that seem to fit at all for stuff that you were saying, Amada? That makes kind of a whole well-rounded for the class and because you completely made that in our, we were talking a little bit yesterday on the phone before this just to get an idea and one of the things we brought up I brought up was that our class was so very diverse and I brought up that like I remembered specifically somebody was in Saudi Arabia taking a course being here as an exchange student and you remembered that and mentioned where he sat and I think that just shows the difference in that class and I felt very I felt everybody spoke in that class it was kind of a popcorn and students were there's some courses where you take I took it as a GE too. So it wasn't necessarily, I was finding out which direction I wanted to go. So I was exploring a lot. And in some courses, it, it's not necessarily the you roll in there, like students or teachers are having, professors are having to force the students to kind of get involved. And I felt in your class, everybody was naturally wanting to talk or the conversations would go over where students were wanting to stay as well. So I think you gave that environment um, from my perspective. And I'm interested, are you, interested in like in the sense of for your student sorry to ask another question but in the way that you've done this has there been how would i word this have students gone on to take master's courses like do you believe that the narrative therapy approach is something where students have kind of asked you is the, what is the way that you grasp this or is there a name for this because i think that's for me i've never put a name to it. And that's, I wish I would have earlier because that would have been kind of nice for me and some of the approaches I've done with you specifically. 
Yeah, sure. Like over the years that's happened where like I've explicitly talked about narrative ideas. Um, I'm also really cautious about uh, naming something that is, um, okay, so let me go back. So I think that uh, the way dominant Western European discourse operates, um, it invites us to name things out of context and then fix them in time so that it becomes like a, a, a thing that, that's not relational. And so um, I know that the, the folks who people think of as generating narrative ideas like Michael White and David Epstein were very reluctant to even call it narrative therapy because of the concern that the way that dominant uh, Western European discourse operates is um, people would start thinking there's like a thing that's called narrative therapy and this is how you do it and these are like the five fundamental principles of it or something along those lines and they didn't want to do that and I don't want to do that so I will share with people that like I'm coming from what would be thought of as a, a narrative perspective um, but I'm also at the same time reluctant to like call that out in particular in class because I, I fear the essentializing that can happen when, um, when we name things and I like, try to identify their fundamental elements. So yes, and I don't always name it as such. So one thing that comes up for me as you just talked, Ronnie, was I know some of your interests are, you know, in teaching or in uh, narrative therapy or in uh, rap and in, in some of the social work. And, and one of the things that I've took from uh, our executive director's uh, education around rap is that it's not an intervention. It's, it's a way of thinking. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of way of being of going about the work. And then what you just said about narrative therapy and Michael White uh, and David Epstein that they didn't want to define it and say this is narrative uh, therapy. So I'm wondering if 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 that's uh, that sort of commonality, if that is in fact as you see it, uh, how I'm seeing it, uh, and then also if that there's something about you and, and your interest in your work and how those that that those two ways of thinking or doing the work uh, uh, is what kind of drives your work and what is that about. You, do you think? So um, what I've come to notice over my years of, of working in like health and human services, um, I've noticed that when there's a name for a program and there are trainings about like doing such and such program, what often happens is that there's then funding available for services and the funding is tied to needing to pick one of these programs. And um, these days this would often be referred to as like evidence-based practices. So that there are these different like, like registered trademarks for models for delivering services that have undergone some level of evaluation more often than not usually using very western european positivist research methods um, frequently with very small sample sizes but still they've gone through some evaluation to be considered an evidence-based practice and if you get your program on that list of evidence-based practices, then public dollars, whether it's state dollars or federal dollars, can be used to provide services to people that um, come from one of those approaches. So there'll be funding that actually stipulates you can only use this funding for an evidence-based practice. So within this whole list of evidence-based practices, 
I've noticed that there are certain ways of working with people that are very consistent with the values that I have for, for working with people. I mean, I, I value uh, people as being experts in their own lives, that uh, I'm not an expert in what someone else's lived experience is. Now, that doesn't mean like I don't know anything. I certainly know my own lived experience. Um, I also am aware of certain uh, strategies that are that can sometimes lead to change, but that's really different than being an expert in somebody's life. So I value any approach that centers the lived experience of people receiving services. Some of these evidence-based practices have that same value set. Those are the ones that I'm attracted to. And, and there are a bunch of them. And uh, more often than not, we can actually trace those models back to the practices that can be found around the world in indigenous communities. That's what I've come to find out, is that um, many of these models that center people's lived experience and part and include multiple uh, identified family members in any sort of process have their origins in different uh, indigenous practices around the world. I got interested in wraparound because wraparound got to be on like that list. It got to be on the list and wraparound is as I understand it, based on the belief that we human beings are more successful in navigating distressing events in life when we do it with other people and when some level of basic needs are met across different life domains. So this isn't like an Abraham Maslow idea here. It's not, it's not that, well, if you know you meet this low level of the pyramid, then you can move to the next. It's actually a belief that uh, all of our domains of our life um, are, in, in, that, they, that their basic level needs to be met in all of these domains in order for us to move forward. Um, so that's what attracted me to wraparound. It's, it's on this list and it's centered around some values that resonate with me personally and that I understand come from non-Western European dominant discourses. Thank you. And uh, just to drill that down a little bit more, what I took from what, what you said is uh, that it's very, I don't maybe not empower, empowering based, sort of empowerment based in the sense of like believing in the community that you're working in, believing in the family that they're experts uh, in their own lives, right? And that it's uh, relational based, that it's not so focused on individualism and intrapsychic phenomena such as uh, is uh, promoted in sort of mainstream mental health, many mainstream mental health systems. Are there any other values or factors that that you would elaborate on that that sort of integrates that that rap model with the 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 narrative therapy uh, besides the sort of the 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 families and the individuals are the experts relational uh, thinking anything else? Well, something else that occurs to me. Um... I mean, though it's related to being relational and people being experts in their own lives, but it's another um, phenomenon that I think is important to call out is that, um, so in, in narrative work, borrowing from the ideas of this anthropologist, Barbara Meyerhoff, there's this concept of outsider wits groups. And so uh, what Barbara Meyerhoff suggested was that we humans, our identity is not an individual achievement. Our identity is something that comes from uh, particular performances that we do as people. This is also really closely related to Judith Butler's idea about performing gender, for example. Um, so Barbara Meyerhoff uh, 
noticed that people's identity emerged from the ways in which audiences uh, bore witness, bared, bared witness, I don't know the past tense of that, but witnessed the performance of identity. And so this is what's considered an outsider witness group. So when, uh, when I think of wraparound, where there's a team of people that is working together to achieve the stated goals of identified individuals and families. And there is a clear reproduction and demonstration of people's strengths, whether these are written down on cards or pieces of paper or somehow represented the strengths that people demonstrate in their lives. And this surrounds the identified individuals or, or families and other people in the team tell stories about people's strengths, then what's happening is that there, there's this outsider witness group that is bearing witness to the stories of people's skills and their achievements and their abilities to you know, survive significant distress. That's witnessing people's preferred identities. And that's something that I believe happens in a, a wraparound child and family team meeting or whatever that might end up being called, that outsider witnessing of people's preferred identities. Thank you, that makes sense. Ronnie, you uh, said a lot that I feel like I wanna unpack and talk about, but one thing um, just based on what you were recently talking about, about witnessing the performance of identity and also, uh, Virgil, your statements about the importance of believing in community. Um, and that brings up for me the importance of believing people's story. And I feel like there's, um, you know, those who benefit from the dominant narratives, they're consistently working to delegitimize stories on the margins because, um, you know, they want to keep power, they want to keep their story in the dominant narrative. Um, and so based on that, for people who are maybe stories aren't being heard or their story is on the margins, what, what have you found that's worked for individuals in your practice to, uh, so that they can be heard or um, you know, their stories are amplified? I really appreciate the way you frame that, Amy, because um, I think that there's a, an idea that somehow people don't have stories. Um, and I, so I don't mean to you know, uh, make anybody feel bad who might use this language, because when you're using language of the dominant discourse, you often don't you know, know where it comes from, because that's how the dominant discourse operates, is invisibly. But um, I often hear good people talk about being a voice for marginalized people or being a voice for someone else. And um, my concern is that suggests that people don't have a voice. And so I appreciate you uh, acknowledging and highlighting that people have these stories, people have voices. What they um, might, what might not be happening is that they may not be being heard. Um, so, I'm interested in creating audiences for the stories that people can tell. Um, this kind of relates back to Amada, you, you know, talking about what, what you noticed in class. Uh, I don't have this belief going in that people aren't aware of their stories. What I think happens is that people are very clear about their stories but they may not have had audiences to bear witness to those stories. It also can be the case that the stories that are most um, like available to people are problem stories. And that gets into like the narrative therapy type stuff. So I want to make sure that people are able to access and, and reconnect with those stories of their lives that are, that are generative, that bring them to new places in their lives, preferred places in their lives. Um, so that's one part of it. 
because if people have experienced the problematic uh, effects of marginalization for a long enough time, there is a chance that there's a lot of space between their preferred stories and the ones that are most available to them, because that's one of the ways that privilege operates is to uh, silence people's stories or to tell their stories for them. I mean, this is really, really clear in uh, colonialism. I, I, one of the most effective strategies of colonialism is to, to prevent people from telling their stories through violence and other forms of harm and through um, these seeming like, like these liberal approaches like re-education um, or bringing science or other, you know, or religion or something like that or particular religions. So force people to stop telling their stories or take over those stories and people aren't telling their preferred, their, their traditional, their um, anchoring stories of their lives. So with your question, I guess, so that one part of it is making, making it possible to the extent that I can for people to access those preferred stories and then creating audiences for them because stories have to have an audience. I mean, they, they just, that's just how stories get brought to life through an audience. And many of us know that through our own experience, just for example, like seeing a really good movie or watching a good book, when you get inside of it and you get transported somewhere else. That's uh, Michael White, uh, before he died, talked about the idea of catharsis. Um, and in the modern Western world, people think of catharsis as this like violent uh, expelling of something that's been repressed and when you do that, you, you've let it out and therefore things get better in life. And he said that he was much more interested in the traditional Greek idea of catharsis, which is um, when people would go to see a play, for example, that they would be moved, physically moved by what they uh, witnessed and reflective on their life so that when they left that play, they were in a different place in relation to their life than they were before. So that's the idea of catharsis as being moved to a different place in your life to look at your life and the world around you. Awesome, thank you. Um, we're gonna take a question from the audience now, uh, Jennifer, Francis asked if you could talk about how you might have tried this at a community organizing level. Yeah, sure. Um, well, maybe I, I could share a little bit about this project that kind of got started last year um, and then has gone into pandemic hibernation for a little bit here, which will hopefully come out again. Um, which, of course, Amy, this is related to a project that you were part of a few years back. Um, would you be willing to just briefly share a little bit about the project that you did so that where I fit in makes more sense? Yeah, I can do that. So um, I was in the Masters of Social Work program at HSU and for we have to do a community project our last year. And that was the year after Josiah Lawson's uh, tragic murder in Arcata. And I really, uh, me and my cohort member, Erin uh, Youngblood Smith, um, she's a, was a black woman who was attending our program. She, uh, I really saw through her how it was rocking um, our African-American community and black students um, attending the university. And it was a really tragic time. And what I was realizing is that um, black students, black community members were um, experiencing and moving through our community in, in a radically different way than I was um, as a white woman. and 
um, feeling the injustice of that. Both Aaron and I felt that very acutely. And so we really felt like we wanted to create a space like you've been talking about uh, to amplify the experiences of uh, students of color at the university, their experiences in our community, um, to create uh, bridges between the community and students of color. So uh, we created a campaign where we interviewed uh, four uh, black students and they shared their, their stories, their good stories, their bad stories, um, why they love the community, their struggles in the community. And we shared those um, through videos. We made posters with their images and their stories on them. And it was uh, a really powerful experience. And I think it was uh, really well received by the community and um, I hope impacted, impacted our community in a positive way. And I was really just so grateful and humbled by the stories of the students and um, grateful that they allowed us to, to hear them. Thank you for sharing that, Amy. And as you know, that project was very impactful for me personally. Um, when I watched the videos and when I saw the posters around businesses in our community, I thought to myself, like, this is what narrative community work looks like, because this is the widespread distribution and um, making available for an audience stories that would otherwise be marginalized. These stories are there. How do we center them more, bring them out of the margins, make sure they're all around us? So when I saw that, I thought, I, I want to do something like that. Um, I'm, one of the things I'm aware of is students' time is um, limited. Like you're in school and then you're done. <laughs> and I don't have any expectation that when people graduate that they're going to keep on these projects. But for me, like this is my job. <laughs> I've been there you know, 20 years. I'm gonna be there for a while longer. I can try to sustain something like this. And so my thought was, um, is it possible to create something that is uh, centered around the, the community around Humboldt Bay? So it it's includes the university, but it's, it's larger than that. And uh, tells the stories of other people who might experience marginalization in this area. People of color, people who identify as um, not, you know, as not being on the gender binary, uh, people who experience homelessness, um, uh, veterans who um, haven't been uh, like provided quality services, a bunch of other groups too. And so what uh, some students had been working on with me is collecting stories of people whose stories would otherwise be marginalized in this area and trying to find a couple of like, just like nuggets, a little some sparkling moments in those stories that are short enough that they could actually be put on like the radio. And then a question would be posed to the listener that invites the listener to notice how they relate to that story. So that um, it's recruiting an audience. It's not just playing the story and hoping people will listen. It's posing a question, which hopefully will grab a listener to be more inside that story. And that the question would be framed in a way where they, there's a relationship because um, the, the sort of premise of all this is that when relationships are stronger in communities, when people feel like they're in relation to others, they're, they're um, more opportunity for respect and kindness to grow and ideally violence and harm and uh, all the forms of marginalization that are related to these stories could potentially diminish. So that was the, the, the thinking behind this project that, uh, that is called We Live Here, which we decided to think of as a sister project to We Are Your Community. And it kind of just got started. And then this virus started wreaking havoc in our community. And 
going to meet with people to collect these stories became impossible. But like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm here for the long haul. So we will get back into that as soon as possible. So getting those stories out there, recruiting audiences and uh, engaging in, qu in question asking that invites that audience to feel like they relate. Dominant cultural this Western dominant cultural discourse that Virgil referred to before is individualism. We are these, um, you know, atomic entities separate from one another with our hard boundaries at our skin. Uh, instead of imagining that we actually are only exist in relation to other people and and non-human animals and and land. Thank you for um, sharing, Ronnie. I think it's interesting because we did the project and it, I think it was after that that narrative therapy kind of came into my understanding and consciousness and it really clicked for me because I was like, wait, I, I did that. Like that, that was, we are your community. So it was really cool to know that, you know, people are practicing narrative therapy every day you know, in community work, in their individual lives, in their families. And um, we're, this is just a name, you know, that we're putting to this thing that's already happening. It's really, it's really cool. Virgil or Amada, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> Wait, let me just, just if it's okay, just, yeah. Um, so that connects really strongly with um, something that Amada was talking about earlier, which is like to, you know, how, do you call it this? Do you tell people it's called this? So you had this experience where you knew that doing this project a particular way was the right thing to do. And it fit in with ways of understanding the world and human behavior and human development. And then later you hear, hey, there's this thing people call narrative therapy and that's what it looks like. Yeah. I One thing that I think, um... Unless Virgil, do you have a question specifically that you're gonna ask? No, go, it's all you. Okay. Just making sure I saw, I don't wanna cut you off as well. Um, I just think for one of the things with narr narrative therapy that you guys were kind of talking about that I was getting through with all three of you guys, just the questions that have been asked is you're kind of telling your story, whoever's talking. But I think for me, it was the main thing that I saw in the class as a student and doing this is that you're not the victim talking about a lot of this you're kind of realizing that it's an empowerment kind of that you're everybody else experiences that and that you're talking about it amongst yourself and this is kind of your life story and you're kind of finally kind of grasping that and being able to kind of tell like what is your story and i think that's kind of the biggest thing with narrative therapy for me in my approach with all of that and how we use these stories to kind of intermingle. And I've never been given an environment to be able to kind of realize, like I've always thought of myself as a victim. And one, one thing that I'm connecting with so much in his class, which I don't mind um, discussing was I was a former foster youth when I was younger for like two or three years and both well, more like two, but it was like a cra it, crazy time. And for me, I've never faced that as an adult coming in. It was always like, I wanna go into this profession, help kids in some way, help youth that have gone through this experience, but not necessarily know how. And when I was taking that class, it was just like all of what, I didn't realize how many, how much it is a, for what foster youth go through and how much it is a grasp here in Humboldt County specifically, cause that was like a huge thing. And then as well as realizing like, I was kind of part of that growing up and this is, here and real and it was kind of a lot to grasp as well as the fact of like I'm not a victim of this like everybody else is here telling their stories as well as like other people know somebody else who experienced this and this is something that kind of I can grow from and really do and so I think I had the choice at the very end because I was doing really well with all my courses I actually had all A's and then this class was the one I was struggling with the most and so I wrote a really we talked and I went to his class and it kind of connects with this idea of community as well with narrative therapy. Um, Geneva came over, she also works in the department um, and she came over and we kind of all talked, discussed how, what was going on. Cause I was just like, needed to tell him how I was feeling about what I was going through with the class. And I was able to write a really well paper and my uncle Julian helped me and figured it out and it worked out really well. 
but it was kind of like having to throw all this paper together to in a conglomerate of like sources of how I can use this, if I recall right, it was kind of like discussing and it, it was almost, it was relieving. It was, and then it was finding all of these sources and putting me in the right direction as well of what I wanna do. And I'm here now and we're here discussing something. So I feel like I went in the right direction and figured out what I wanna do. But I think for me, more of my question would be is have you found a way kind of in narrative therapy to find a way to tell your story to empower it and because I wondered have you connected to narrative therapy and what is your connection to it kind of specifically in leading to this and how you do this in teaching thank you Amada for uh sharing with me sort of how I got to be part of that journey for you of re-identifying like you know who you are um it just it re reminded me when you were saying that um, narrative work, as I think about narrative work, because there's different narrative ideas, but the kind of narrative therapy that I'm uh, connected to is very much informed by uh, this French uh, philosopher kind of person. He didn't like to call himself a philosopher, Michel Foucault. And he wrote quite a lot about the notion of a, of a gaze, uh, like a like a, a a way of sort of looking at people that happens from having very limited knowledge about them. So if in the in the Western European dominant discourse, being somebody who's lived in um, uh, foster homes is uh, is connected to sort of being a problemed kid, then many people who identify as foster kids would be likely to have stories about about being a foster kid that um, are like not helpful stories. But the way that happens is through other people who meet you, who hear that you experienced foster care, imposing this gaze as if just knowing that you've been in foster care somehow tells us like everything about you. You know, like, oh, well, I know what that must be like. That's the idea of the gaze, that you can know somebody from some limited characteristic of their life. Um, and that can change. So if there's this idea of a victim, then, and, I, and my gaze is you're a victim, then it's not a surprise that, that you and many other people might experience themselves as victims. If the dominant discourse about uh, being in foster care was one of people who must demonstrate a wide variety of skills of living, being able to adapt with uncertainty and inconsistency um, and uh, forming many relationships, then we might identify somebody who's experienced foster care as a strong, competent, uh, well-rounded person. And if that became the gaze so that like, you meet somebody and you say, yeah, you know, I was in, uh, I was in foster care. And the gaze was about appreciation and um, gratitude and uh, acknowledgement of strengths and skills that would lead to a wholly different experience. So I, I just wanted to say that what you were talking about made me think about Michel Foucault's idea of the gaze and how that transforms people's lives. In terms of like me and my story, um, as somebody who experiences so many kinds of privilege related to like social identity and social categories, my story is told so frequently. Uh, I am more interested in listening to other people's stories so that they can enrich and expand the, the stories that inform how I look at the world. Stories of white people, stories of people in heterosexual relationships, stories of people who aren't dealing with poverty, stories of people who do like manness the way that expected, those stories are everywhere. Those are the ones that occupy most of the space. So I know those stories and other people know my stories because of that. What connected me to narrative work is learning that all this stuff about stories can actually be used to bring about change. That's where I was like, narrative work, that's my thing. 
because I was already thinking about how dominant ideas are shaping of people's lives and overwhelmingly the problems that people experience in their lives can be traced to these dominant stories. And when I heard about narrative work that deconstructs dominant stories and constructs new stories, that's where I found my home. Thank you for sharing that. I kind of feel some people don't, I don't know, some people always think in the necessarily in the grasp of like, I like how you shared, it's not narrative here, isn't this, you do it this way, this way, and this way. It can kind of come in all approaches. And I think you just touched on that too, with how you've taken it and you've grasped it in your way and kind of have, this is how you were approached to it. So I thank you for sharing that too. And Virgil, you can go ahead and take off. Yeah, I just had a follow up to that uh, as, and maybe as a way to sort of summarize or, or just dig a little deeper. You know, I think that Ronnie, you have uh, been a really uh, strong ally. I really, you know, you've immersed yourself in the local uh, as much as you can in the native community. And I know one of the things, whether we're in native social work or native mental health is the term, uh, the concept of decolonization. And so my question is, is do you feel like a narrative therapy goes far enough to uh, decolonize? And if not, like what would be some of the critiques of narrative therapy around uh, decolonization? You know, whether it's the social construction framework or uh, our theory or, or just, you know, pushing back a little bit on narrative therapy or uh, this, the, the, the systems uh, and just want to bring in this decolonize, decolonizing framework because, you know, Two Feathers is a, is a, is a uh, place where we serve native communities. Uh, and so I think that we have to bring in decolonization into the, the conversation. Uh, so when I think about decolonization, um, what I what I envision as like full decolonization would be the return of all native lands to the uh, in original people who lived on those lands and. Um, and I don't know if it's like, would be non-native people or just like federal and state governments, but other sovereign entities not meddling in native people's sovereignty unless asked. So it's not about like, oh, do your own thing. I don't wanna be involved. It's, I'd love to be involved if invited to be involved. So for me, that's that's what like decolonization um, at at like one end would be. It's native peoples deciding their own ways of being in the world with their own land. Um, so to the extent that narrative folks are not actively working to return native land and get out of native people's business, then they're not doing decolonization. And I'm sure a lot of people in the native community are not doing that because that's a really like tough proposition to put out there to return all land to native peoples. Um, so I can believe in that, but I'm not like, I'm not going to the city council right now and, and saying we should you know, my house should be returned to we are people. It's a, it's a complicated world we are now living in. Colonization has been very successful at um, tying me to its practices so that I have to support and perpetuate colonization on a regular basis. The place where I have my job, the place where I have my house. Um, what I'd like to believe is that there are people in the narrative community, as in any uh, self-identified community, who do believe that uh, non-native people should only participate in 
the the livelihood of native people's health and wellness if invited to do so and not to insert ourselves into it that's probably as far as the decolonization that i can achieve without you know like you know turning over the deed to the we are people I, I do, I, I got to figure out how to say this because I don't want this to sound like self-serving. Okay, let me just say generally, many Native communities have adopted honor taxes, which are one way that narrative practitioners and anybody can do something that has a real fiscal value to it to um, pay respects for the, the stealing of land. That's something that's important to me. Thank you. That that was uh, helpful. And I'm going to turn it back over to Amy or Mata. I see we're winding down at time, so maybe Ronnie, you have you know one two questions left. How's that sound? Sounds good. Sounds good. I was going to go to another audience question, um, and maybe this one is a little bit more about I think uh, focusing it in on therapy, we've been talking a lot about like community work and, and uh, larger systems, but for somebody who wants to practice narrative therapy, um, you know, in uh, mental health ways and other realms, um, Jennifer Francis, again, was asking about um, um, how how we can view ways in which the dominant discourse um, can be harmful to people. So I think, um, you know, for many of us in the fields that we're working in, we're, we see how dominant discourse has harmed and traumatized individuals um, throughout history um, and the continuing negative effects of that. So how can we work with um, clients and with, within ourselves to identify um, that harm and then also work to, to heal some of that harm? So uh, just like one example that comes to my mind because I was we were talking about the discourse of productivity earlier is uh, um, that there are significant problems that many people experience in their lives because of the use of methamphetamine uh, and other uh, kinds of, uh, of stimulants. And, and I'm talking about people who are, who will say like, this has been problematic for me. So, uh, you know, the dominant discourse would have us see that as some sort of individual problem or individual failure. I would be curious if, um, if somebody uh, was interested in making the connection between use of stimulants to work harder, to not sleep, to not have to eat, to be more productive, and how that is actually reproducing the dominant discourse of productivity. Because um, what I've come to see in terms of like stimulant use across the globe is that stimulant like amphetamines, methamphetamines, problems related to amphetamines and methamphetamines seem to be on a larger scale in those nations that are more closely connected to Western European ideas of um, economic growth of neoliberalism. Um, so that to me is a way to make this connection about the dominant discourse and harm to individuals. Why, you know, is it acceptable to believe that you have to be so productive that you cause harm to yourself through not sleeping and not eating, for example? So are you, when you're, um doing work with clients, are you asking those questions directly to the client and asking them to interrogate that? Or how do you go about exploring that with, with an individual that you're working with? It's tough to answer in a short period of time. What I mean, because generally my questions when I'm working with somebody directly follow whatever the last things is that somebody said. So um, if it so happened that somebody started to share that you know, they were using a particular substance so that they could 
stay up later, work harder, not have to sleep, you know, something to sort of keep them going. I might ask uh, how they came to the idea that they need to keep going no matter what. And then perhaps, I mean, if it's something that seems like a reasonable conversation, we might get to looking at how this fits in with larger ideas of productivity that squeeze every amount of energy out of somebody to turn it into profit. Thank you. I guess, so I have one more question, sorry. <laughs> um, going off of that, if um, somebody who's listening or um, watching this later is interested in learning more about narrative work um, and how to implement it in their practice, is there one place that you would suggest that uh, individuals start? No, <laughs> there's never one place for anything. Um, there are so many good books, uh, but they cost money. I'm into free stuff. I like I like when stuff's free. So the Dulwich Center in Australia, um, where Michael White had been doing his work, has a website with a lot of free resources. Um, the Family Therapy Center, or just I think it's called the Family Center in New Zealand, where David Epstein uh, did uh, a lot of his work, and they're still around doing cool stuff. They have a website with free resources. There's a website called narrativeapproaches.com, which has a bunch of free resources. And from there, I, I, people can find stuff that costs money too. Awesome, thank you. Well, I think we're um, about finished here. We're past an hour. Ronnie, do you have anything that you'd like to um, finish off with? Anything you'd like to share or promote or discuss? I want to thank you again, Amy and Amanda and Virgil and Two Feathers. Uh, I think your organization is doing the good work in a tough world. Um, I appreciate being able to spend some time talking with you, particularly when there's so much trauma going on. And thank you, uh, Ronnie, I appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to add one thing, you know, one of the reasons for uh, us at Two Feathers doing a speaker series such as uh, we're doing right now with narrative therapy is that we believe uh, in thinking outside the box and creating uh, uh, programs that, that will help our native community. And we believe that narrative therapy and the work that Ronnie's done not only in narrative therapy, but also in the RAP model can help our native community. While we're not gonna solve all the problems because a lot of them have been going on for 500 plus years and a lot of them are structural and systemic, we're just trying to help in the best way we can and putting forth people such as Amy, such as Amada, such as Ronnie, that can best support our community as, as we see it. And so uh, we will continue with the narrative therapy series uh, on Tuesday with David Nyland. And we will also have uh, one or two more in this series. So please tune in. And uh, Ahmad is going to take it on home uh, with some last comments. I just want to thank you, Ronnie. I think this is cool just to be with and Two Feathers as a whole thing, and Virgil for putting this kind of series together, I guess you can say, and Amy too, just everybody I think who's been a part of it. It's given all of us a grounding to be able to come back, and I was Two Feathers youth as really young too and did their services, and so it's all around I'm able to come back and then talk with professors and be a part of it with my cohorts. I think this is really fun, so thank you again, Ronnie, for coming and talking too, and I hopefully we'll do some trainings in the future as well. Thanks a lot. Take care. See ya. Thank you.